Okay, thanks Jack and uh, to Simon and Society for having us today. Uh, I've got to admit before I start that um, I'm one of the ones that put their hands up as not being an archaeologist this morning, so please be gentle with me. Um, so in the next 20 minutes or so, uh, we'll give you a bit of background on the castle and, and what we did there. Um, and then we'll take you through some of the comparative work that we're continuing to work on uh, when looking at the castle. Um, the Commission's involvement came about when Historic Scotland and the owners of the castle, the Codwell Estate, had been talking about a, a programme of works and grant funding. And as part of that, we were allowed uh, access to the island and, and given a couple of weeks um, before the birds mating season when we were allowed to, to go and climb all over it and, uh, and basically do a, a lot of recording that people hadn't done before. So quickly some orientation, um, for the user, those of you that don't know, here's Walking Dog here. Um, it sits about seven kilometres uh, to the northwest of uh, Cranton upon Spey, and here we go here. Uh, it now sits um, in the middle of what's regarded as the Dava Moor on an island uh, in, the, in the loch, obviously in the name Walking Dog. What this, what this doesn't show now is the change in the landscape that Walking Dog has gone through, that this was once a heavily wooded, uh, forested um, area. Um, you can just see the, the single track road which is running through here now. It's now well out of the way, 10 minutes drive off the main road from Granton to Forest. Uh, and it seems, by the modern perceptions, uh, that nobody quite knows why it's there. So the castle was built um, in a building campaign which, which occurred between 1260 and 1280, which was carried out by the communes who were the, the lords of Barnock. Lock and Dorb, together with um, Inverlochy and Rutherland Castle are, were, the, were the main seats of the, the communes, Lords of Badna, uh, and the castle was, was built at this time. And the castle has been studied and planned previously, uh, unsurprisingly, first by McGibbon and Ross. Uh, secondly, <coughs> um, Simpson came along and published a plan of it. The Ministry of Works made it there just after Simpson produced another plan which kind of puts a lot of things down to debris. And then finally, in 1983, uh, a chap called Corbett published a plan of it. Now, none of these are wholly accurate, and if you take individual constituent parts of them, put them together, then you get the start of what is the, f the first, uh, the ground floor plan which we produced for Lock and Dorb. So what we see here is a quadrilateral um, enclosure castle with round towers engaged at each corner, and the red is a second phase of works which occurred um, We've dated it as being between 1300 and 1335, we'll come on to that later. Uh, and then some uh, later additions and uh, the, the footprints of, of, of buildings which sit within the courtyard. The commission survey has also produced for the first time a first floor plan of the castle. Um, we've also done uh, sexual profiles through the island, hand-on details uh, of details which survive intact, arrow slit windows, and we've recorded round windows which uh, survive in the round towers, uh, a reconstruction of the, the main gateway in the second phase, uh, second phase wall, and some 200 images which uh, illustrate everything that we're going to have a look at now. And these are all available to, to view via Canmo now, and uh, we'll have a look at what we found. So when you approach the castle for today, um, you, you approach it as people always have done from the east shore of Loch and Dorb, the castle is about 700 metres off the, the, the east shore of the, of the loch, and you're met here by this, this, the second phase wall. All we can say really is that this is an absolutely featureless wall, apart from the fact that there was this gateway put into the north end of it. You can see seasonal builds and, and things like that running through it, but other than that, we, we don't have any evidence for openings up to this stage anyway. So having a look at the second phase gateway, which we saw at the north end, sitting here, um, what does survive is enough to give us a couple of, uh, luckily the, the, the ashlar which the arch sprung from uh, survives here together with a portcullis slot here and this is about the end of a bar hole coming through here, allowing us to do a, a, a reconstruction section through the, through the um, here and uh, what we've got on the other side of the wall is what must have been the site of a gatehouse at some point. There are very faint footings running along here and here where the, the majority of the gatehouse would have sat. And also down this, what looks like a crack from the outside, there are a few tuskers which are sticking out here which shows where something has tied in and has possibly given a loud 
given access to what would have been a, a, a portcullis slot up here. So while the main gateway is located to the east, um, the main landing place has been on the north. This, is, uh, this has led to some confusion in the first interpretations of the castle where McGibbon and Ross describe this here as the main entrance to the castle on the north side. Um, this area here is the only area of the island where it is, uh, appears to be safe to, to land the boat. Um, so we assume that this has always been the landing place for it. But evidence for this opening here being anything more than a, a north postern it has all but gone. All that survives is a, is a bar slot on this side of it, and any defence of this uh, this gateway must have come from above, and that's that's what's been taken taken away from the castle. Moving on, uh, going round the corner, through the second phase entrance, you then come to the first phase principal elevation of the castle, um, where we find the first phase entrance, which is located here. And this is that's it in this picture here. So what we have is. A, gate, a gateway here, which again, uh, most of the, the evidence of, for it has, has been completely lost. Um, what we don't have is any evidence of a portcullis slot here. Um, there is evidence of a bar hole surviving. You can see it's on either side of the drawings. And any, uh, any defence of, of this entrance here has come from above. On the first floor plan here, we have evidence for one, two, three openings which have gone through uh, the enclosure wall of the castle, which have sat directly above the, the, this entrance passage through here. Um, there's also windows on the, the flanking tower, which have, have given uh, covering fire to, to this entrance. These ranges of the courtyard on the inside, as we're seeing here, um, had the, the main entrance through it and what has been described here as the chapel. This was described as a chapel in the, the statistical account, and again, well, this was repeated through um, the work of McGibbon and Ross, and I think also by Simpson. Um, what we found on the ground was evidence for this actually being a second phase addition to the castle. Here, there's uh, the jom of a window coming from the chamber which sat along the top of the East Range, facing, and that now sits facing into this building here. And there's also footings, uh, which we find here, and a tie back to the, the, the main east wall. Um, so in this area here, there's been a lot of fall, and uh, you can actually see the, the, the dressed stone of the first phase here, running around the corner. And it's just simply, this second phase building is simply abutted up next to it. So instead of it being a chapel, we've now kind of discovered that this is probably a series of small spaces, um, which we, we can't attribute any, any function to. Going to the other end of the, the northeast range, sorry, the east range, we come to the northeast corner, where the largest, what would probably be described as the principal um, round tower, engages with the corner of the quadril quadrilateral enclosure. And here we find that there have been quite a few changes that, that, are, that have gone on through, through uh, between the first and the second phases. And um, on this round tower is where we've recorded. Um, some of the best preserved arrow slot windows. There's also some ashlar which survives up here up the side of this ombre and we've got an opening here which in the first phase served as a guard road. So in, fa in phasing the changes which have, which have occurred here, um, at first floor we've had one, what, looked, what appears to be one large chamber running along the top uh, of the range here. Um, so this is, this is what we're, we're finding here, and simply a guard rope projected off the side of the round tower, as we find uh, on, every guard, on every round tower at Lock and Dog. In the second phase, somebody's come along and uh, adjusted this guard rope um, to form a passage through into the hall, which now sits on the north side of the castle, as we saw in the, the photograph of the approach. And this has necess necessitated the remodelling of this window here on the round tower, and the, the insertion of a, a new wall here. Um, this is a, a wall that's been thickened and sits at a slightly different angle to the first phase wall. It also demonstrates how um, the, there's different floor levels running between the floor level of the main chamber at first floor here and in the round tower there's a floor level running about two feet un underneath that level which must have been stepped down into. 
So the second phase hall, which, is, which was accessed through this guard room, um, here is where the, the site of the original guard room, which has now been lost and taken away, and um, this has formed what appears to be two passages going through, and this blue strip here is where we've got evidence that the second phase wall has tied back to the round tower. The second phase hall also we find evidence in the north enclosure wall where they, they've slotted the joist holes for the floor into it, and then up here there are a pair of joist holes which run all the way through the wall and appear to have been some kind of support for um, gallery and stairs which allows movement from this first floor chamber here down into the hall. Within, on this wall here, uh, which is the only upstanding wall which remains of the hall, there's evidence for uh, a number of joist holes which suggests that there's been some kind of dividing wall support or wall supporting this gallery running down here, which then places this window in the centre of the wall. And again, there's, uh, this is the level of the floor running through. South East corner, again, uh, as we were saying about the guard robes and uh, tying back to the round towers, we have originally have, had the guard robe here, um, this rectangle here, um, which has been removed and a repair has been carried out and as shown on the drawings like this. Uh, this then accommodates the tying in of the second phase wall, where this red, red wall here has come round the corner and been brought back to abut onto the round tower, forming only just, you know, just a small section of the original round tower then was, um, was uh, visible after the second phase additions. Again, uh, and within the fall, we have a few Tusker stones which uh, feed back into the, the, um, the, the foundations or, or the, the lower ground level here of the, the round tower to, to evidence this wall coming back. The southwest corner tower has, an, as we've seen, another guard road, and this one's particularly important to the understanding of Walking Door, as what we have here. What, seems to be at first floor when you're actually, at ground level when you're actually standing within the courtyard. Um, we have a triple guard robe with the, the highest level of the guard robe being, actually being at, at first floor as opposed to ground floor. So what this does is gives us two additional floors above what is we regard as the, the first floor of the castle in the plans which we've produced, which suggests that we've lost at least one floor uh, of the main enclosure castle, plus another another guard road which served any wall walk and possibly higher towers, um, as we find at a ca the, the castles that we'll come to look at soon. West wall of the courtyards. Very quickly, we've got a block postern here, um, visible up to full height, and then this round tower here, which has these uh, round windows in it, which are one of the, the, the details which we've, we've drawn out and available for you to view. Um, and then this is the courtyard elevation of here. Now what looks as if it's been pretty much a blank elevation in the first view actually has quite a few details which we can uh, pick out. Where the block postern comes through, um, we actually find the top of the postern is pretty much ground level uh, inside the courtyard with a scarcement adjacent to it here which is then run across the top of the postern. And to the left of that, we have a series of joist holes in the, the wall, which suggests that there has, joist holes of a size which suggests there has been uh, a larger building here, possibly the original hall for um, the castle, which was then replaced with the second phase additions. The fall in the ground level here between the inside of the courtyard here and what we saw in the previous slide, um, is about five feet and, and that suggests that there has been a significant change in ground level over the course of the five, 550 years is it, since the castle, the castle was abandoned. So people coming through the, the postern block, probably in the second phase, were coming through here into a basement level with a hall above them, uh, possibly stretching to two storeys and then a wall walk which gives us the extra story served by the guard room and the extra store, the guard room, extra, the wall walk which is served by the second guard room. So that was it. We thought that um, we'd been, we'd recorded the evidence and we thought we'd, we'd cracked it. And then somebody uploaded something to my camera. <laughs>
Uh, for those of you that don't know, my Canmore is a, is a relatively new section of the Commission's website where people can make public contributions. And this is a public contribution by somebody called James Bowen, who had been up and were doing aerial survey. Now, this, this picture actually ties in mostly with what we've found on the ground, and we were quite happy with that, apart from this section here, where other areas where we'd drawn in what we thought were probably, you know, timber kitchen buildings, which uh, served the various ranges, and this addition here, um, this appears. So we've been up uh, at the start of, last, of the month as well, and done our own survey. Um, we've yet to do uh, interpretation of, of, of anything that we see here. Roughly here is where we're probably seeing what was showing up in that aerial, uh, in that previous aerial picture. Um, but these, are, again, will be available to, to view via Canmore um, as soon as I get into cataloging them. Very quickly, just some historical notes on Lock and Dog. Um, the, the, the first one, as we said earlier, built in 1260 to 1280 by the communes, uh, Lords of Bagnach, during the building campaign, which also included Inverloch, Crosvin, and Blair. Um, the first historical reference is in 1302. Um, Edward the first intermittently stayed at the castle in 1303 when he went to receive the, um, the loyalty of, of the various subjects up there. And during this time, uh, the diaries which were made show that he was flitting between Lock and Dorb and the positions thought to be somewhere around Boat and Garten, moving through the forest. Now, why he was doing this, one of the, the reasons, the only reasons that we can think of this is that Lock and Dorb perhaps served at least in part as a hunting lodge and that the king was actually here and was moving back and forwards and joined the hospitality of the area. So, Castle was then handed over to the Earls of Murray and it flips, between, it flips back and forward between private ownership and the crown. At this point, it was in, by the 1340s, it was uh, um, used by the crown. It was then handed over to the Wolf of Badenoch, uh, who used it as one of his lairs. And um, it was from here that he set off to burn uh, the cathedral in Elgin. Finally, it's passed on to the, the Black Douglas, he's Douglas Earl, Earl of Murray, and um, he is he fortifies the castle. We don't know what that means, but we, we have a note which says that he fortifies the castle. And then following his death, um, it's dismant the crown dismantles walking door with a deliberate act. So that's what we found, and here's the questions that we're asking. Um, who was responsible for the second phase enlargement and strengthening of the castle? Why did the crown choose to dismantle the castle? Why is Lock and Dog built where it is? And what are the precedents and contemporaries for the form? Quickly move back here. Um, we've got four or five fairly, um, you know, very important people, all of whom uh, owned and were resident in the castle. We've got the, we've got the communes. We've got Edward the First. We've got the Randolph Earls of Murray who owned it twice. We have the Scottish Crown, we have the Stuarts, Wolf Barney, and then we have the Douglases. From the features which we found on this, the second phase works, to be honest, any one of these could have built this. And, I mean, it's, it's a big wall, and the, 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 um, the detail which we have left on the cut ashlars and that type of thing doesn't really allow us to tie to this work back to, to any one of them. Uh, we have a 19th century uh, unreferenced, uh, unreferenced statement that Edward the First was responsible for the building of it, and we've dated it as being pre-1335, as this siege took place. Um, on the, the thinking behind us dating it to pre-1335, is that um, the, the, we know that this siege included uh, the castle being attacked by trebuchet, and. Um, People couldn't, we don't think that people could get onto the castle, onto the island at this point, that they were having to lay siege to the castle from the other shoreline. Um, and, uh, you know, this siege was unsuccessful. People were not able to, to get in there. Eventually, Sir, Sir Andrew Murray was chased away by Edward III, and uh, the castle remained intact. And, um, okay. Uh, Finally, we're looking at why did the crown, not finally, why did the crown choose to dismantle one of the finest castles in Scotland? And we kind of know that. There's a, uh, in a book which was published by the, the Spalding Club in the mid 19th century, um, translating papers in the Codder uh, Estate Library, 
Um, the Royal Charter states that from its position and strength, the castle was a danger to royal power. So we know that the castle was regarded as a place of such power that the, and, and strength that the Crown deliberately set about taking this apart as opposed to, to hanging on to it themselves. Um, that still doesn't answer the question as to why they didn't choose to hang on to it themselves. Maybe the castle at this point was seen as being old-fashioned. Maybe the area which the castle was in was seen as somewhere which the royals didn't want to have, uh, you know, d didn't seem to think it necessary for them to have uh, any status, any presence. But we don't know that. That's, that's part of our ongoing look. Ongoing look. Um, and why was Lock and Dog built where it is? Well, here the castle is dismantled in 14. The 1450s. Uh, Pont's map uh, of 1583 to 1601 shows us where the castle is. Another hundred years after that, nearly, sorry, it's another 50 years, Robert Gordon's map of West Murray Plain features Lock and Dog again, all the time featuring a castle which has now been ruinous for 100, 150 years. And then on to Roy's military map in 1747, Lock and Dog is here, and for the first time this map places this road which runs past it. Now if we look at the distribution of the common castles across um, the Barnock area moving up into the Buchan where the, the cousins of the Earls of Barnock, the Earls of Buchan, uh, were, the, were the ruling uh, house. Inverlochy Castle, Rusvin, Blair just off the map here, and Loch and Dob. Basically all of these are positions which, allow, which controls movement through the main routes of the highlands. So anybody that was coming from the west or from the south up past Rusvin, Commune Castle, who wanted to get to Elgin, one of the main centres of the day, this was the quickest route moving up past Lock and Dog. So Lock and Dog, we reckon, because of its position and strength and you know, the, the strength of the, the additions which were made to it, was pretty much impenetrable. Um, they were able to take advantage of the, um, the hunting which went on in the forests, but it also gave the communes control of this key part, this key route which run, runs on the road between, no, this is granted here, so it goes up over Dava, then meeting the road to Dava, so this gave access to Forres, Elgin, and even to Nairn up here. So that's why we think Walking Door is where it is. But when we're looking at the precedence for the, the form of walking dog, um, the communes didn't just sit in Murray. Um, they had influence in Persia. Here's Blair Castle here. They're also known to have had control, the constableship of a castle at Dull. There's, we don't know, I can't find exactly where the castle here is. If anybody knows anything about that, then please tell me. They held the, the constableship of Cluny. They also owned lands at Findelgask and at Ochtertyre, where there's an, another castle which is described locally as Cornwall's Castle. And what we've also marked on here is Moulin and Kinclaven, which we'll come to in a minute. And then in the south, the, the, the Cornwall's uh, held just as much power and influence as Gal in Galloway as they did in the north. The seat, seat here was at Dal Swinton. They also held the constableship of Bridborough Castle, which, again, you can't find exactly where this is. This is where Grudber is, so it's in this, this area. They were sheriffs of Wigtown and held influence over the castle here. Their cousins, the Earls of Buchan, were responsible for the, the building of Cargleton Castle, and they were also <coughs> they also held a constableship at the end of the 13th century for <coughs> Kirkcubry Castle. Um, similarly, um, we've marked on Tibbers and Rocking Castle here, Dumfries, Kerlaverick and Whittle Castle, which we'll come to in a second. To the east of this as well, they, they also had the, in the borders the, the Commune Castle of uh, Bedro, and further south in Northumberland, they, 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 were, uh, they, they held a, a seat at Tarset as well. So the, um, the Commune influence ran all the way through Scotland down into England as well. So this is from the Atlas of Scottish History in 1707. And this is showing us roughly where the 13th century castles are thought to be. Here, the ones which are outlined in black are the commune castles, demonstrating that they held a, you know, that they had this kind of line, castles running all the way across Scotland to, get, to give them 
uh, staging posts and, and influence right the way across the north of it. Um, similarly, in Scotland, in uh, Galloway, there's, a, there's a, uh, a group of them here. And this, what we've picked out here is the, the enclosure castle becoming the dominant, stone enclosure castle becoming the dominant 13th century form uh, in castle building. Um, either I've called it rectilinear, it maybe should be um, quadrilateral. Um, other geometric ones, as we'll see, and ones which were maybe uh, naturally dictated or dictated by a building on an earlier site, as we, we saw earlier, and uh, I think it was Murray Shore done here. Um, so here's Lock and Dorb, and what we're, what we're finding is that Lock and Dorb seems to be a middling point between small castles such as Roy, King, uh, I think this is King Clavin here. This is Balvenie, which, although you know, vastly expanded now, um, looks as if it's been a, a roughly quadrilateral castle with the, the start of, of Towers on the Corners. Um, this is uh, the other um, type of ca castle which was predominant at the time. We've got Roxborough, Pedro, which was the Commune's castle, and uh, this is Brutal, which is, uh, you know, uh, would may be uh, influential in their thinking at the time because this was the mother-in-law's castle to John Commune. And then we've got this, uh, a, a group of, of castles which continue to be developed past uh, what we find at Lock and Dog here. Um, we've got geometric castles which are, are, are then picked up and are developed further and further and further. So we know there are elements of 13th century castles in here. Um, how complete the, the defence system and how that functioned, we're not very sure. So we can tie, tie Lock and Dog down to com direct comparison with four others in Scotland. Inverlochy, one of the other four castles built um, by the communes in uh, the 1260 to 1280 period. Aachen, Tibbers and Moulin. Now, as far as we know, Aachen, Tibbers and Moulin are all later than uh, Lock and Dog. What we have here is uh, cast castles which were built by smaller members of the nobility. Um, there may be a, a, a family link to suggest that Moulin could be a, ca a, a, or a, a commune castle or a commune influence castle. This is something that we ne now need to have a, a, a better look at. And Ockham and Tibbers sit in areas where there was direct commune influence over the, uh, the, the activities at the time. And Inverlochy Castle is the most direct comparison. Uh, but again, there, there's differences here. What seems to be at Inverlochy is that in the basement levels, uh, and at first floor level, um, you have a, a most sophisticated uh, defence defense setup where people can move through the walls of these round towers. And um, there's also bar holes, which suggest that, that um, people that they were kind of planning for people maybe getting inside the, the enclosure here and still being able to defend the, the towers and the tops of the walls. And as you move up, um, you've got a much more sophisticated um, set up of wall walks and uh, openings which give cover, you know, a series of openings which allow people to fire both down into the enclosure and outside. And this second floor plan together with the higher towers here, which we find at Inverlochy, may be starting to give us an indication of what has been deliberately dismantled at Lock and Dog by the, um, by the state when they decided that, to take the castle out of use. That still doesn't, we've still not, not found a direct comparison which predates um, Lock and Dog in Scotland though. And here we are, the, the comparison has been drawn with uh, Flint Castle, one of the Edwardian castles in Wales, but again this is slightly later than uh, Lock and Dog being built. Here we are in Nestle and this is Dourdan, close in France, showing similar sets up of round towers engaged in the corners of quadrilateral enclosures. And this is, forgive me if this is a, a little bit um, out of the blue, but this is a, a link which we only established on Thursday, which we need to have a look at further. This is Pevensey Castle in the south of England. Now we know that John Comyn first uh, fought on the side of the English king against Simon de Montfort at the Battle of Lewes in 1250, forgive me if that's wrong. No, 1264, sorry. Now, Pevensey Castle was built in 1250, and 
when they've been given uh, a good doing at the Battle of Luz, the nobility from there are known to have taken shelter in Pevensey Castle. So there is the possibility that John Commune, having been beaten at the castle at the Battle of Luz, then was laid siege to by Simon de Montfort in Pevensey Castle in 1264, uh, which is right at the start of this period where we were saying that uh, the communes were, were beginning their, their, their series of castle, their castle building in the, the Murray and Buchan area. So that, that's a link that, again, we need to have a, a look for a bit more evidence before we can uh, tie it up. So quickly, a summary of the findings. We found a quadrilateral enclosure castle uh, with second phase additions and some remodelling of the first phase to make way for this. Um, significant first phase buildings on the west have now been lost and replaced by the second phase. Um, no evidence of staircases through the, the entire thing. Think, they think that these were either timber or enclosed in the buildings which are now long gone. Um, the only, unre only unreferenced documentary evidence that we have for the second phase of the work of Edward I is not reliable, so we can't really rely on this. Um, 1335 suggests that the castle was impregnable at this point, but at the same time, any one of the people that owned the castle, uh, we would suggest, were capable of, of uh, building what's been, what's been uh, well, what, what was added to the castle. And finally, the location. It is remote now. It's always been remote, yet strategically important. Uh, and uh, combining that strength with being a, some type of hunting lodge and, and place for the, the, the Earls of Barnwick to, to enjoy the, the spoils of, of their estate. And one of two fully realised and little altered examples alongside uh, Inverlochie of the sort of Wardian style, which Closure Castle has, is called it Wardian style now, contemporary in date to some in England and Wales. And I've put questions up, but I think that's going to come at the end. So thanks very much.